All right, so as I said, the um, <coughs> at the end of the day, I'll always put a copy of my code, well, almost always. I'll put a copy of my code so you can confirm my code and your code. If it goes up, if it works up to this point, very good. If, if not, uh, we'll have a more lab time at the end of the day. This is also, again, uh, I wanted to jump in right away, day two. This, honestly, is utterly simple JavaScript. It does get a lot harder than this. So this is just a way to um, also check on yourself. This, this is a lot of what we're in for, a lot of writing. Uh, a lot of coding and a lot of course could go wrong and of course I'm here to help as best as possible but we won't have the time to cover the most basic of all of this that's why we've got the other classes that's why we've got websites that's why we've got books we've always got a goal I want to do this so I need to learn this code to do that uh, so as I've shown before and I'll show us again we've got these um, apps that the previous students made and I get students coming in all the time that have no experience and they go through the whole course and they do make an app. I get people coming in with a lot of experience and they make that app and a little bit more. So I think all levels could do well, but it's going to be a lot of this where you can decide um, the, your metal for, for this type of a class. So if we've gotten it up to this point, uh, the next point is, okay, uh, the idea here is that submit is pressed and more will happen. The more is let's retrieve what the person typed into those into those um, input boxes. So in this function we're in the world of this function right here. We're defining more code in this function that runs after a submit. Well we're gonna check what the person typed into those boxes. Those boxes have an ID. Therefore, we can create variables that represent those HTML elements. Inside of this function, we'll create a variable. We'll call it val in first name. equal to document dot get element by ID semicolon end of statement so we're creating another variable another object this one though in contrast this is a local scope object or a variable only works or is accessible within this function. Higher up on the code we created a we created a global scope object, a global variable. The L form user was a variable that could be accessed anywhere in the code. This one only is accessible in this function. The way JavaScript works is top to bottom, left to right, unless we change the flow. And we've changed the flow right here because when the code is processed, it goes top to bottom, it comes to this point, and it doesn't execute everything in here. It waits until we click Submit. So JavaScript got up, or the web browser got up to this point and just put into the memory, okay, there's a function called function save name. But it didn't execute anything inside of it. It wouldn't make sense for it to execute it because we're waiting for someone to type in their name. So then we've got, we've changed the flow right here. That when then a person clicks submit, the web browser then jumps back to where the function is defined and then gets into the function and starts processing the lines of code. Once it gets to the final closing parenthesis, or curly brace, then it goes back to the regular flow of the code. So it makes sense that this code in here in this function doesn't execute until some sort of event makes it happen. The reason why we might then have local scope variables also is we only need to know what the person typed into that box at the moment that they click Submit. If we were to define these variables, 
at the top over here, like I did for the form, it's going to check what's in that box, which is nothing, when the, when the program first runs. <coughs> no one has typed anything into these boxes when the, when the program first runs, so it's going to check and see nothing. So we don't want to check what's in this element until we've clicked Submit. That's why we define a variable inside of the function. That input field is in first name. Dot value. Local scoped object only works inside of this function. As this function runs, it checks the value of what the input field named in first name is, then stores it in an object, in, in, stores it in that object. A deeper topic for later is memory management and all of that. Uh, creating objects takes up memory in the browser. And um, having more objects, more variables, and all of that takes up more memory, slows down the program, all of that. We'll get into deeper concepts of that later. Uh, local scope objects take up more memory. I mean, uh, global scope objects take up more memory than local scope. Local scope objects only exist for as long as this function is running. Again, that's a little deep than I want to get into at the moment. But the big idea is don't check what's in that box until the person clicks Submit. To see that in action, we'll give ourselves some console output. We'll give ourselves a message inside of the console. Simply, in the console of the web browser, after I type something in and click Submit, I should expect to see in the console what I typed into on first name. Not in last name. I haven't created any sort of variable to hold that yet. So give that a try. Save it and run it. If there's giving you an error message, check what line number it might be telling you. You might have misspelled something. If it worked, after you type something into one of those boxes, you have to type something into both of those boxes because they're both required. But it will only tell you in the console what you typed into one of them because we're only creating an object and outputting one of them so far. Let's see if mine is on track. I'm going to run it. F12. No errors. I'm going to fill in something. Something else. I'm going to click Go. I get the output back from line 69 that said we <coughs> click the button. Then on line 78, it says something, because I literally typed something in that box. Obviously, if I type something real, click Go, it says that's what I typed into, into the box. Line 78, column 6, line 78, right there. Line 78 says, output what was the value of in first name. That comes from document.getElementById. So search inside of the document find an element based on its ID. The input field had an ID in first name. Check the value, dot value, check the value of what the person typed in there. All of that then gets stored or assigned with the equals to that object. In the console, display the contents of that object. <coughs> If I misspelled some of this stuff, I will get some sort of <coughs> error message. Let's say I, I wrote in first names. Well, that's going to be an error because type error, document is null. 
line 77. I don't know what that message means. Maybe I click learn more. It still doesn't help me. But line 77 hopefully is telling me, go look on line 77, column 27. Have you noticed that as you move your, as you move your lines up and down, this tells me I'm on line 96, column whatever. So line 76 down, column to the right. It's trying to tell me, go look on line, in my case, line 77. Oh, I see it. In first names. It's not going to tell you exactly, you named your ID wrong. There's no debugger that helps you that well, unfortunately. You know, we have not figured out a way to have like error messages that are very human friendly, very human readable. Um, this is one of the big problems in software that these systems can give you output in error messages about, you know, missing semicolon, that's easy to fix. Uh, oh, you had an extra parenthesis, that's easy to fix. But it's very hard for it to tell you, you named your IDs wrong. That's not a syntax error, that's a logic error. There may be something somewhere in my app called in first name, and there may be something else called in first names. It's not an error, it's just that I need to use them certain ways. So this is going to be one of the big issues when we're doing this debugging and figuring out our errors. Did you spell the code right, number one, and did you spell what you think you're working with? Did you, did you spell correctly what you invented? The ID that you invented, that you called it whatever you want, did you spell it the right way? Uppercase and lowercase definitely matters. So raise your hand if you did see output, correct output in your console. A few people, good. Now take your hand and pat yourself on the back. You are a programmer. If you didn't, uh, if you didn't quite get that to work, we'll of course be checking your work in a little bit. But if it's working, you will see this output of what was typed into the first box. Let me pause right there. Anyone need some help? You do need to get that working before we get more working. Question? Thank you. 
It says here. Yeah, so seventy-three twenty-eight. Um, Which one is twenty-eight? Yeah. This one. Yeah. 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 All right, so if we're able to get this part working, we're building this idea of <coughs> input, then going to output. So this function, again, using Notepad++, for example, simply clicking, not really selecting, but clicking next to that curly brace of this function should show its pair. Something basic like that is going to help you to also troubleshoot. Um, so all that we're doing at the moment exists inside of this function, which is called after we click Submit. Um, let's, let me mention a couple of things also that might be helpful. Uh, as I um, type the code, do you notice oftentimes I zoom in for you to see a little better? You have that ability also on your own computer. You can do it a couple of ways. One is if you uh, hold down the Windows key and then press plus, I, I can't pull my keyboard, but Windows key and the plus symbol on the number pad on the right, that gives you a way to zoom in and out uh, everywhere. There's also a way to zoom in and out only inside of the code, because notice if you do Windows plus, it zooms in your whole screen. You might not want that. Another way to zoom in and out is inside of Notepad++ itself. If you hold Control and then scroll wheel up or down, it scrolls in and out of your code in Notepad only, not the whole screen. I know for some of you, your, your mouse wheel is not working for some <coughs> reason. Sorry about that. Uh, but you can also do it via the View menu, View Zoom. So inside of Notepad, view, zoom, and then you've got here, control mouse wheel or control number pad, plus and minus. 
reset back to normal. So I usually do the the Windows Plus to zoom in my whole screen. Sometimes I might do the Control <coughs> Scroll Wheel to to show you something. So uh, that might be useful. Uh, doing the zoom in and zoom out to your code. What's also useful for the code? Let's take a little segue right here. Right now, our color coding, um, right, our color changes be depending on our code. And the default color coding is actually not the best. Um, it's, it, it induces a lot of fatigue because if you're using a code editor, if you're writing code for a lot, right now you're staring at a white screen and it's blasting you with white light. You have all of these little colors, but that's a lot of white light coming right at you. That's going to make your eyes tired. You can change the color of your screen to a more pleasant, darker colors, which gives less fatigue to your eye. Let's see how you can change your color scheme here. If you go up to settings, you go to style configurator. I don't think configurator is a real word, but let's go to style configurator under settings. Here's our default colors. If you put it on something like Bespin, well, that's a little easier to read. Now, it's harder on my projector, but on your screen, probably looks really nice and good contrast and such. If you go to something else like uh, Choco, you get a slightly different color. There's one called Navajo. Uh, I wouldn't quite do that one. That one's not contrasty enough. But, you know, whatever looks good to you as a way to, uh, to, to view your code a little more pleasantly. Obsidian is really nice. I'm going to keep mine on the default because on my projector nothing looks that good for you except the default. But I would recommend on your own, when we're here for three and a half hours, I would recommend to you change your style here for something a little bit nicer to view. I wouldn't do solarized either, that's too bright. Twilight looks nice. So once you find a color that looks good for you, like let's say Blackboard, you can click Save. And that's, I think, nice contrasts in the colors and these are my attributes again the color doesn't matter red doesn't mean wrong it just means it's a different color and it looks like that but I will say that when you're serious about coding and and you're gonna make real apps you know real coders use Hello Kitty <laughs> so whichever one you like I'm gonna go back to the default but um, you can change your colors there under the style configurator. And remember, zooming in and out might be useful. Uh, is that a 1 or an L? Uh, is that an O or a 0? So I usually zoom in to kind of show you that stuff. And uh, I think it is useful. So Control, Scroll Wheel, <coughs> or Windows Plus and Minus, you zoom in that way too. Let's see where we're at at the moment. We've got our we've got our input. It is seeing that I wrote something in first name. We need to do something very, very similar for last name. Inside of our function, save name, we've checked what's inside of the box first name. We need to do something very similar for last name. So in the order here, at this point it doesn't matter, but let's say before my console output, I will create another variable. I want the value of the input field last name, which is based on or, or comes from scanning the document uh, object using get element by ID sum ID dot value give me the value property so we've had dot something parentheses method dot value property give me what has been typed in give me the value of what has been typed in that element based on its ID, okay, based on the quotes in last name. So basically, do something on the right and set that equal to what's on the left. Take what's on the right and put it into what's on the left. 
give me the value of that object and put it into that object on the left. In last name. Then we can also do console log val in last name. And here's your test. Do it for the hobby. Do it for the hobby box. I'm not going to do it yet. You, based on what we've done here, should be able to retrieve what has been typed into the hobby and display it in console. I'll do it in a moment, but you try it first. You have the knowledge so far to attempt that. So these things that we're doing here, we're going to do them a lot. We need, there's some sort of input fields. We need to retrieve the value of those fields, and we do something with them. We're not quite there yet. We're simply confirming that we are able to check what has been typed into those fields. Eventually, um, we're going to create our app, which like I said, it's the comic book database, CBDB. The app that we're going to create is a, is a database app. It's going to have different users. One person logs in with their email and password and sees their collection. Another person logs in with their email and their password and sees their collection. So we need a way for, uh, for some sort of input fields for emails and passwords. We need to store those emails and passwords. When a person tries to sign in, we will then have some function that checks who is trying, trying to sign in and is the password correct. If that matches up, run another function that then moves them from the welcome screen to the home screen. When they want to save a comic, there's a button that they click that will run a function that will check what comic are you saving, store it in the database, oh, there's an error, run another function that says there's an error, play a sound. So we're going to do these building blocks right here over and over, creating objects, functions, event listeners. These like five or six ingredients are going to be used <coughs> over and over and in advanced ways to do advanced things. Uh, so it's going to be a lot of this sort of programming, but conceptually it's object-oriented programming. Let me catch up with you. You probably already did it. Var val in hobbies equals to document dot get element by ID. Give me the value property quotes in hobbies. I just need to remember that I call it hobby or hobbies. I always forget this stuff. Hobbies. That's good. Uh, then I can do console log output to my newly created val in hobbies and to fully test it. To fully test it, I then put in stuff here, here, and here. Go. So I get the first field, the second field, the third field. And so what we want to do is, OK, we are retrieving that data. We want to do something with it and show it on screen. We have an invisible div. We have this div where I want it to say, welcome, Victor Campos. 
seems that your favorite hobby is reading. So I want it to then change to whoever uh, does the input to display on screen. So remember, we've got an invisible div right here with an ID. We need to access that div via JavaScript and then write something into it. In this case, in this case, we're going to um, do a little logic here to decide what to do. Question, ladies? Okay. Here, what we've got is three variables that we only need to care about at the moment we click Submit. We've got three input fields we only need to care about at the moment of Submit. These variables, these objects, only exist for the duration that the function is running. So when we click Submit, the web browser jumps back to find function save name, and then it starts to execute these lines. It gets to the final closing curly brace. The function is done. It then dumps those variables from memory. It's done. There's pros and cons to that. Um, what I want is to display these pieces of data on screen. Well, on screen, we've got a div placeholder. So we're going to create a variable for it, just like before. But what I'm trying to get at is we need to decide, will we create an object in as a global scope object or a local scope? Global scope, remember, is any variable outside of a function. It can be used anywhere in the code. Local scope is a variable that can only be used inside of a function. With such a simple project, it probably doesn't matter which of the two that we do. But logically, I would probably create the global scope object because I want to reuse that div different ways. I don't want to redefine and recheck the variable and recreate it every time. That takes up memory. I want to define it early on. There is a div in the HTML. Let's create a JavaScript object of it. And then let's use it wherever else we want in the code. Technically, what happens here, every time we click Submit, it creates these variables again. It takes up a little bit of processing power and memory every time to create these objects, to check the value, and then use the result. So for our very basic program, it probably doesn't matter per, uh, performance-wise. But I would say uh, we're going to back up to where we originally created our global object of the form to also create another object uh, for that div. We saw that we just started to create VAR. Let me show you a, a shortcut right here. Uh, yeah, it's three extra characters, and then you write whatever. But here's a shortcut that might be useful as time goes on. Instead of the previous line ending with a semicolon, delete that and put a comma. Because this is saying, let's create a variable, let's create an object called this, and comma another variable called something, comma, and another one. So next line, you don't have to say var again. You just say l div result. What do we call it result? Results, plural, equal to document.getElement by id, semicolon there, quotes div results. So create one variable, and then comma another one, then end of statement. Some people like this, some people don't. It's very obvious the way we did it a moment ago. VAR, new variable, end of statement. Next line, VAR, new variable, semicolon, end of statement. Next line, VAR, another variable, end of statement. Another way to do it is you start one variable declaration. You define one variable, semicolon. I'm defining another one, so I do not write VAR again. I'm borrowing my first var statement to create another variable. 
but this only works if the previous one has a comma. Then I'm done creating two variables, so I end it. Or if I have a third one I'm going to create, don't do this, but if I had a third one, comma, another var equal to document blah blah blah, semicolon. So some people don't like this because you forget you do this. Start a variable, create a variable, end. I didn't say create a variable, end a variable, error. Because I didn't say create a variable, so then it's going to say, what are you trying to do here? Get element by ID for what? Because the previous line, I ended it, should have been a comma. Start creating one, create another one, then end the statement. I personally like it this way because I'm used to it. As a beginner, uh, it's just another thing to memorize, and we've already got too many things to memorize, so you may or may not want to do this. But uh, on my notes here, hopefully it helps you remember the comma here is because we're doing something and then we're continuing the command, so to speak. It saves a little processing power, a little bit of memory. Yeah, because this is all the same statement doing things. If we have them in two separate vars, it has to process two different things. Okay. Uh, so it could be memory efficient as well. But it, with such a tiny program, it's not a big deal. But on bigger programs, it could be a big deal. <coughs> Create one variable, then comma, another, then end of statement. Could be more efficient. Could cause you to forget proper syntax. Okay, so we're creating a JavaScript object of an of an HTML node L div results. Element div results. We can use the the shorthand. Um, I then want to take the three things that the person typed and display them inside of this div. I want, the, I want those things to be displayed after the person clicks submit, meaning inside the function. So check what they wrote, and then display what they wrote. Back to the function, function save name. We've done this stuff that we check what they wrote. We confirmed what they wrote in the console. I want to now display it on screen. So next line. We can write the note. Display on screen what the user wrote. L div results. Object, method, object, method, object, method, object, we've got a method. We've got a command that we can execute, so to speak, on that object, dot inner HTML. Sorry, I'm getting ahead of myself. Not that yet. Um, inner HTML equals. Not parentheses, not a, not a method, a property. Um, up here we had, uh, let's go look at this input field and get the value. We can use something like this to set a value as well. We can set a value of an input field. Uh, we can set the property value of an input field. Here we're going to set the property of inner HTML. Uh, we're going to write. Uh, any valid HTML into this input field. This is again the power of JavaScript. We can use JavaScript to write HTML. Just to see this for the moment, let's type quotes semicolon. We'll say h1 hello. This is valid HTML. Now earlier I said you don't write HTML in the JavaScript block. Well, of course, there are exceptions. So I'm saying, let's write some HTML in this object 
in quotes, h1 tag, some text, end of h1. Save it and run it. Click Submit. Obviously fill in the required fields. something on these fields, click go, it says hello. Big and bold because of H1. The H1, the, the HTML code is processed. This is one of the JavaScript commands that will process HTML. <coughs> so there's an object, L div results. We're setting its inner HTML property. We're writing HTML code into it. When we click Go, it says hello. Obviously, I wanted to say what was typed into the boxes. So we can confirm on those console outputs that whatever we type into those, whatever's, whatever's in those vars, that's what the person typed. So we'll have it say hello, val in first name, Val in last name, your hobby is Val in hobby. Hello, comma, Val in first name, plus, well, I won't say that yet, Val in last name, exclamation point, space, your hobby is Val in hobbies. Okay, this seems right. When a moment ago I tested it and it simply said hello, clicking submit, okay, that makes sense. Now, logically, from what we've seen so far to the console output, val in first name and val in last name and val in hobbies should display what was typed into those boxes. Go ahead and save it and, and check that. Go ahead and save it and run it and see what happens. See what happens. Let me see what happens. When I run that, I'm going to fill in my name, Victor Campos. So I'm going to say reading. I'm going to say go. And look what happens. It says, hello, Val in first name, Val in last name. Your hobby is Val in hobbies. It didn't display what was in the objects, it displayed literally those objects. What we're doing here is string output, literal string output. Very fancy way of saying literally what's in the quotes is what displays on screen. Display on screen what the user wrote. Anything in quotes, so quotes, will display literally this is one of the few times you can you can literally use literally correct. Anything in quotes will display literally as is a string. Fancy terms we'll talk about later. So when things are in quotes, they will display exactly like that, literally. I don't want that. I want to display what's in those variables. But it worked a moment ago, but what's different? It was out to the console, yes, but no quotes, no quotation marks. When we had no quotation marks, it displayed what was in the variable. For fun, and hopefully you do this when we're not in class, what if I do this? What if I do that? What if I put quotes there? What will happen <coughs> there is that it should display exactly that in quotes. in the console right there. So when it was in quotes, it displayed the name of the object, not what was in the object. So we need to do something pretty fancy here. In quotes, 
what is in there is being processed as HTML. I want to display some plain old HTML, and then I want to display JavaScript, and then I want to display more HTML. So watch this for a moment first, and then we'll do it. I'm going to end quote here, plus, plus, plus quote. So don't do this yet, but let me show you what's, gonna, what's about to happen here. By putting those plus symbols, By putting the plus symbols, it's going to then actually process the, the value of the variable, not display the name of the variable. I'll show you what I did in just a moment. But now here, it's displaying what I wrote in the variable, missing a space, but it's displaying what I wrote in the name. <coughs> in the variable. I haven't done that one yet, so it's still like that. But now when anything is typed in here, it does change. So let me back up and explain what I'm doing here, then we'll do it. So just watch a moment. I've got a string literal first. Literally display this first. Quote, end quote. Plus, this is concatenation. We're displaying this, and then we're displaying this. Without quotes, display what's inside the variable, plus. And then display what's inside of that, plus. Quotes, display something literal, which is your hobby is. Well, now I want that part to not be literal, so I would have to do something like end the quote, plus, continue. We'll do this in a moment plus quote. So now that should be display my name there, then literally your hobby is, plus whatever they wrote, plus end the HTML. We'll do this in a moment and we'll polish it up because this is again reminds us why computers are dumb because look at that, it put the name right next to each other and uh, where's my exclamation point and the, that other little bit of stuff. So let me undo this all so that we can do it together. You see the idea. Everything in, the, in quotes right there will be processed as HTML. It's not going to process these three JavaScript objects. So we need to say first process this HTML plus and then process this JavaScript. So this is the case where, quote, where empty spaces do matter. So there's one empty space here before that JavaScript. So end quote, space plus space. Start displaying this HTML, stop HTML, and then display this JavaScript. Usually between a first name and a last name is a space. So actually, we have to do space plus quote space quote space plus we need to also display a space between the names computers dumb it doesn't know that I want a space between my name it thinks I'm Victor Campos one word no I'm Victor space Campos so I have to in between then say write some HTML display the JavaScript and then an empty space of, job, of HTML and then JavaScript that exclamation point is part of the HTML, so space plus quote. The HTML then continues again. It looks weird like that, but then that's attached to the last name. Space, your hobby is, that's got to be separated. I've got to use the plus symbol, which is concatenation. Very, very fancy way of kind of saying like building things. You're building this plus this plus this. You're combining this plus this plus this. So we'll see in JavaScript and in most languages, you know, 1 plus 1 does not equal 2. 1 plus 1 equals 11. We'll see why later. But we're building a little HTML plus a little JavaScript plus some more HTML plus more JavaScript plus more HTML and quote plus JavaScript 
plus quote final HTML. Now when you save it and run it. Yes. Uh, so what if someone doesn't enter the hobby? If someone doesn't enter the hobby, very good point. Yes, I'm assuming they enter all the hobbies. Perhaps I should set the text area as required. So they have to enter the hobby. If they didn't enter the hobby, I'd have to write more JavaScript to, to check. Did they not type anything into the hobby? Therefore, don't even say your hobby is. So we would have to make a conditional statement. In the condition of no hobby, display something else. In the condition of a hobby, display something else. So we'll get to the point where we can make decisions. Right now, again, it doesn't know what we want. It's very dumb. So it's just going to display anything, even if you put nothing in. So we'll have to teach it and tell it what we want. So if we run it this way now, Jeff Smith hobbies reading go. Hello, Jeff Space Smith, exclamation point. Your hobby is reading. Uh, if I put someone else here, Janet Jones, hobby is skiing. Next line. Biking. Okay, well, we get into another issue here. Dumb computer. It's supposed to be skiing and biking. And it simply said skiing biking. Well, we didn't program it to understand that more than one item should be then with a comma or an and or something. And this is the reason why software is complicated. We use software. We click a button. We tap an icon, and it works. Well, someone had to program that. Dozens or hundreds of people had to program it. People had to write hundreds or thousands or millions of lines of code. All of this that we're doing in Windows, if I click Maximize, that is lines of code that someone programmed. That means it's going to redraw the screen big. And when I click that same button, now it knows to redraw it small. So everything that we do, this click and this drag, there's an event listener on the event of a click and a drag move the box x and y coordinates on screen. So everything that we do with software is some sort of language doing something. We now are in charge of that. We are now an app developer. We're going to make an app. We need to know event listeners. We need to debug. We need to check the code. We need to troubleshoot. We need to figure out this user error. Actually, it wasn't a user error. We never figured it out that we should have separated these into multiple lines and all of that. And that's OK. There's a lot to learn. But you don't need to know everything. But we're focusing on these various goals to accomplish the big tasks of the class. This is as far as I want to go at the moment today. And even though it seems simple, if you got it to work up to this point, you are doing the classic operations input processing storage output these concepts that have been around since you know the first computers in the 30s and the 40s and the 50s we're doing it via JavaScript one of many programming languages that exist if you've used any other language C sharp Java maybe it's not the exact same code but it's the exact same concept input processing storage retrieval those four main concepts and if it works smoothly, great. If it didn't, that's what our breaks and help is for. Um, at the moment, I'm going to end the main lecture. <coughs> General questions up to this point? That's not a general question. I will help you in a moment. So um, I'm going to put my code in the network folder. Let me remind you where the network folder is. So you can uh, take a look at my code, compare with your code. And we'll do a little lab time until 9.30. We come back next time. We'll we'll continue. So the code that I have up to this point, you can go to the desktop and then let's open up the computer window. Let's open computer. And then you'll see network location, classroom data drive Z, Z as in zebra. Open up Classroom Data Drive Z, and then you will see our class, Campus Mad 1. Open that. You see two files. The template that I created, so you don't have to create a file completely from scratch every time, and the code we did 
that I did right now that in my case seems to work. So you can copy those two. I'll turn on the printer in a little bit if you'd like to print it. You can email it to yourself. You can save it to your flash drive. And um, once you have a copy of it, I, I didn't mention last time, but when you've got Notepad++ installed and you've got a copy of some HTML code, you can right-click the HTML code and you'll get the option from the menu, Edit with Notepad++. You can also open Notepad++ and go to File, Open. But you can, uh, in Windows, if you've got Notepad++ installed or others like brackets, you can right-click. You usually have some sort of editor, not regular edit. That will open in plain old Notepad, which is, or I guess in my case, Word. I don't want it to open in Word. That'll be weird. So um, you can right-click Edit Notepad++, and you can open the code.